Welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show on 94.7 The Pulse. Music, interviews, news and, well, two blokes chatting. Now, here are the two blokes. Here's a man who I think has a really, really good relationship with uh, removal companies because he's played for Victoria, South Australia, the Kochi Tuskers, Kerala side, Adelaide Strikers, Worcestershire, Gloucestershire, Western Australia, the Perth Scorchers, the Coolmuck Titans and now... He finds himself uh, heading up the elite talent in the New South Wales cricket uh, environment. Michael Klinger, good morning. Uh, good morning, guys. How are you going? That's scary when you read them all like, like that, Neil. I knew he'd been about, but that's bloody ridiculous. Yeah, it moves around. <laughs> he's no Dan Christian, but he's given it a fair nudge. <laughs> <laughs> now, I... It a fair bit over 21 years, but um, yeah, that was certainly worth it. I have uh, done the right thing and sought approval, and uh, Maxi Klinger will be uh, officially joining us now rather than Michael. Um, Maxi, tell us the the story. Started in in Melbourne, a, a local boy, a Victorian boy. Um, the journey. What what was sort of the reasoning behind the moves? Was it just circumstantial, or was it a little bit of your own desire to experience different environments? No, I mean, the, the, the Australian ones were, were more around opportunity. So um, growing up in Victoria, I was very fortunate to be in the pathways and played under 17s and 19s and, and got my, my first day contract when I was in year 12 at school as an 18-year-old. So it was um, extremely well supported by the Victorian setup. And at, at eight years in Victoria, um, probably to my own fault, didn't establish myself in the team fully. I think I played about 45 first-class games and quite a lot of one day games I probably played consistent cricket in one day one day stuff and, and was sort of a, a regular opening batter there and then in and out of the shield team over that period um, mainly because it was I was just wasn't scoring enough runs in a consistent basis um, and plus it, during that period was when there was quite a lot of Australian representation so guys like Brad Hodge and Dave Hussey Cameron White Matthew Elliott when I first started coming in and out of the team a fair bit so even if you're making runs, at times you, you, you get pushed out because the quality of those guys coming back was obviously very high. The uh, South Australian trip, was that something that you sought or, or were you sought? Because I know there's a lot of recruiting in the off-season, dragging players with Geelong Cricket Club has lost its own aim and vines to Tassie and, and I believe Tasmania came looking for him. How did the story f- unfold for you? Yeah, it was 2008, um, so I was 27 at the time and uh, Rod Marsh was a director of cricket back then at, at um, South Australia and they had a, a, a few years where they, they probably weren't performing at their best and, and they saw me as a sort of on the fringe, a, a regular one-day player, as I said, and a fringe shield player and they, they came and asked me um, if it's something I'd be interested in. I was still under contract, another year on my contract with Victoria, um, but at the time I had a good chat with Greg Shippard, who was a coach, um, and I think Victoria were quite keen on recruiting Chris Rogers, so it sort of worked out for the best um, with, with me taking an opportunity to South Australia and then allowing, obviously, another spot for, for Chris Rogers to come in and worked out for Victoria with Chris and, and myself at South Australia. Um, it was a, a tough move. Obviously, all my family's in Melbourne, and but to, to move, um, it was the best move I made in my career because not only did it sort of get it, me a bit of a kickstart in Australia to open up opportunities, like you mentioned earlier, overseas, where I could go um, after performing a couple of years in a row, play some county cricket, play in the IPL um, and, and all that sort of stuff. So it was really a, a move for opportunity originally, but definitely opened up the second half of my career. One of the big stories in cricket at the moment is the the amount of different cricket being played. Your career probably arrived just as um, those differences were played. Probably the amount of one-day cricket was lifted um, the opportunity to play different formats in England of course um, accelerated at the time so the need to be adaptable uh, was probably in major focus about your time um, w- was that an early help or um, a detriment to your to your cricket no I think it was it was a help I did a lot of work on my technique um, from a from a young age and and potentially that could have been a detriment early in my career maybe thinking too much about technique rather than actually just competing against the, the bowler and the opposition um, but what it did give me was a, a good base to, to work from um, I suppose into my white ball cricket 
one day in T20 cricket. So I, I think you know, if you can have that strong base um, in terms of your, your technique, then you can certainly expand into all formats. And I, when 2020 cricket first started, I'll be the first to admit I wasn't that good at it. And it took um, it probably took South Australia qualifying for the Champions League one year, which was a tournament where the best T20 um, franchises across the world met up and, and played. We had a tournament in South Africa um, and then followed by another one in um, India. And, and it's probably the, the six months leading into that first one where I worked really hard on my T20 cricket in the indoor centre in um, in South Australia, actually, the Adelaide Oval. And then um, just basically from there was able to, to pick up a T20 game that worked for me and and then just playing a lot of matches. I think as a young cricketer or any cricketer, playing matches is the key to learning and developing. And um, we had a lot of practice matches going into that tournament, and I was lucky enough to do well and then opened up other opportunities in T20 cricket around the world. Um, Maxie, I'm an old bloke, and I didn't like T20 cricket when I started until I went to the MCG and watched uh, Brad Hodge make about a 70 watching him live. And, yep. and all I saw was him playing cricket shots into gaps for four. He wasn't just ploughing it over deep mid on. You were a very similar play. You weren't renowned for your for your hitting it into the grandstand. You just played genuine cricket shots, three hundred and sixty degrees, but just played them with more fluency and, and confidence. Was it just a matter of in that environment just backing your skill set, finding gaps because you were quite good at that and, and thriving on that? Yeah, it was initially, but then um, I think if you just did that, you your game would have sort of come to a halt. You always had to continue to develop to be a step ahead because you've got to remember everyone around the world was improving at you know, at a similar rate in T20 cricket, so you still had to continue to develop. So I had to develop some sort of a power game as well, which I worked on. So when I say that, it was you know from six overs onwards, when, when the field goes back, you still need to be able to clear the ropes. So, um, But, yeah, I had a pretty distinct game plan in T20 cricket to, to hit either through or over the field um, in the first six overs with good cricket shots and then try to ex- be a bit more expansive once the field went out. And, and interesting you mentioned Brad Hodge there because I remember when I had a couple of discussions with him because he played a fair bit of T20 cricket in England before it even came out in Australia. So um, when my younger days in Victoria chatting to him around the way, he went about his T20 cricket as an opener, um, really became my sort of game plan as well uh, throughout my career. Yeah, I, I thought so. I, just, I think it's a, it's probably better to watch someone hit a cover drive over the infield for four or in some cases six, but I think that's much more attractive than watching one go over deep mid wicket. Yeah, I think I think it's the makeup of the player as well. You know, if you if you've got Chris Gale's build and you know height and strength, then then you can do that. I didn't have that unfortunately, and, and you know Hodgie was strong, but he was you know also didn't have the long levers as some of as someone like a Chris Gale or some other. No really clean strikers, but um, you know you got to make the most of what you've got as uh, physically and also skillfully and, and talent-wise. And um, yeah, I suppose I, I, I feel I, I got pretty close to the maximum out of what I could give. So Maxie, it's Neil. I'm um, just fascinated by the. I used to bat at number. 11 more often than not because there was only 11 spots in the team otherwise I probably would have batted at number 12 so the, the thing in my hand that hit the ball is not something I, I would consider a weapon but um, I'm, I'm const- I think about the other bloke who plays Australian cricket called Maxi, and he might give a different answer to this question is it easier to manage your game plan in, in inverted commas if you are opening the batting in other words you've got a predictable you know what's going to happen sort of more so than you would coming in maybe at 3 or 5 or 7 yeah, yeah, definitely. Because um, you know, you know, you've got twenty overs to bat if you bat well enough, um, and you can you can plan before the game starts. So, for example, I used to know, I used to study which bowlers would bowl which overs in opposition team. Um, I wasn't probably as a, as you mentioned before, a natural big striker of the ball, and so I had to get any edge I could over um, other players in an opposition to to you know to, to stay at the top of my game in T20 cricket. So I should do a lot of analysis and opposition, try to work out which overs, you bowl, which bowlers bowl which overs and um, and come up with a game plan leading into every game. So, you know, for example, there might be, say, playing against the Melbourne Stars in the early days and you had Malinga used to bowl overs one and three. You knew they were going to be pretty tough overs, so you knew overs two and four. You had to be more proactive and, and try and take down. So I should try and plan really well just to try and be a step ahead of, um, everyone else, and and so there's definitely able to do that when you're batting, as you said, in the middle order, like a 
like a Maxwell or, or, or others, um, you don't know when you're going to come in. So you certainly need to be a bit more adaptable and, and probably a bit more of a free spirit than I was, like um, like Maxi is. And he was able to, you know, he's, well, he still is, he's able to dominate games and, and without, I suppose, knowing when he's going to come in during that match. But I guess this is where the tactics component comes into it, isn't it? That the captain would say, now I'll bet you Maxi Klinger's coming in here and he's expecting Malinga to bowl the first over. We'll toss the ball to, Ma- to Glenn Maxwell, for example. I suppose that's the, that's the consistency of, of the, the, the continually changing tactics in 20, T20. Yeah, and, I mean, and that's the, the role of captain in T20 is probably the most important in any format because you always need to be thinking on your feet. It's the most stressful, but it's. I found it. You know, I, I captained a fair bit in T20 cricket in Australia and overseas. It's, it's also the most fun at the same time because you can actually, you can actually have a huge effect on winning or sometimes losing the game if, if you get something wrong. So it's um, yeah, ca- captaining in T20 cricket is huge. And, and as you said, if you can be a step ahead of the opposition or um, the way the opposition might be planning or, or thinking, then it, it can go a long way to win the game. Uh, Max, you're in a very interesting position in your career now because the cricket world is at uh, quite at a crossroads. Uh, Test cricket's losing its appeal unless it's Australia v England. Uh, everyone's looking for that slap bang quick entertainment. Um, my vintage, and I'm sure your vintage, you played cricket because you wanted to wear a baggy green cap, play five days, play for Australia. Um, you're seeing teenagers now up close. Are those passionate? Uh, cricket dreams still there or, or are younger people these days thinking more about getting a career to earn them a living and that's whatever game format it takes? Yeah, I suppose you need to ask everyone on an individual basis but my gut feel is that the best cricketers still want to play as well as they can in all formats. So they still want to play test cricket for Australia. They want to play one day in T20 cricket for Australia and they want to play IPL and franchises. They want to be the best at everything. Um, possibly the ones who may not feel they have the ability or may not have the confidence in themselves to be good at all that, those formats, they're the guys who I think potentially decide to, to specialise in, um, in, in say, T20 cricket and, and play franchise cricket and make a, a living that way. But, I, I'm, you know, I see a lot of young kids coming through. I speak to a lot of young players, even... When I was coaching the Renegades post my career and now um, at my role as head of cricket at, at Cricket New South Wales is um, is very much around the the guys who are coming through who are confident in themselves and their ability that they're still very much willing to play and wanting to play Test Cricket for Australia. So I think that's really important. Um, I'd say it's probably maybe more the ones who aren't as confident in that that they decide to specialise in the shorter format a little bit earlier because it means they can... Um, you know, make a living out of it as well if they're good enough. Yeah, I think back well, of to... Course, uh, if we... Go, Neil. Sorry, with just a slight tongue-in-cheek comment, I guess that uh, the people you're working with now, they've uh, obviously set themselves well up to be um, test cricketers for Australia because they were born in New South Wales. Is that fair? <laughs> yeah, I don't think they've been a selector from New South Wales for a while, so it's, it's a bit hard to say that, <laughs> that now. But, um, yeah, I mean... It is, there are a lot of quality players there. Like I'm obviously working there now, and uh, we have a meeting with Cricket Australia just on the um, on how our CA contracts of players are playing next week and players of interest. And there's a really big list there for us to go through. Whereas you know potentially in another state they might only be chatting around two or three players. There's um, ten plus, so it's um, it's a good position to be in. It's, it, what it does with Cricket New South Wales is, is it sometimes creates a lot of uh, turnover be- between teams because you could have one one week where you got all the test players playing leading into a, an Asher series and then the next week you lose five or six or seven players out of that team. So um, it provides some good opportunities for young players as well. Um, but it's certainly great. Like, I know pre-season now, we've had a, a few guys around, guys like Nathan Lyon and uh, Pat Cummins around pre-season. And you know, to have those guys around and, and influencing some of our young players in a positive way uh, and sharing their their thoughts on, on cricket and, and helping their development has is, is been huge for them during the last couple of months. Oh, so watch with interest uh, when Matthew Renshaw first played for Australia and I just thought this bloke is a seriously good long-term test cricketer. That spot's going to be set for life. He looks so compact and resolute. And not long later, I see him batting at number five for Brisbane Heat in the 2020 Slogathon. I'm scratching my head and think, what on earth is going on here? And I don't know whether we'll ever see him play for Australia again. And Something's gone wrong there. Is is he an example of uh, players getting mixed up with what 
they want to be or need to be? Uh, I'm not sure if he's probably the, the right... I think he just... I think he wanted to be a long-term test opener, as you mentioned, but probably was got slightly out of form and, and got turned over. And I'm not sure exactly who came in after him. It may have been Marcus Harris or... Um, who was sort of piling on the runs in shield cricket. But I think if you asked him, he'd, he'd definitely want to be a long-term opener for, for Australia. Um, I suppose once he lost that spot, he has a choice of either doing nothing in December, January and, and sitting at home in Brisbane or playing uh, T20 cricket. So obviously most players would choose to, to be playing rather than they're not doing anything at all. And he, he's been, he turned himself into a pretty good middle-order T20 player. Um, he's also batting in the middle-order for, for Queensland now in shield cricket, I think, at number four. So... I don't know if that's a change of tactic or that's been, um, if that's coming from Queensland or Cricket Australia, but um, he, he's someone who I think certainly got the ability to play Test cricket again. Um, he probably just needs to keep piling on the runs and be consistent like some other guys, like your, your Marcus Harris's and those guys have been um, doing for a while in Shield cricket. Uh, lots of talk about uh, the dressing room in Australia now. Uh, coaching captain Tim uh, Payne's career is not long. I think he's done a fantastic job in the short term after Sandpaper Gate rattled Australian cricket. But uh, are you a bit concerned, looking from outside in, about where that very important um, Australian dressing room, because it is the pinnacle still of uh, of Australian cricket and kids' dreams, is, is it just a little bit off the mark at the moment? Um, do you mean in terms of, of leadership? Yeah, the leadership is the yeah. is the key word. Yes. Yeah, so I think um, Tim Payne has done, obviously done a fantastic job. He came in at a really difficult time uh, when he was probably just trying to cement his own spot in the team, I suppose, as a as a keeper batter and, and ended up captaining and, and sort of taking the, the team through a tumultuous period um, after the South African incident. So um, I think he's done a fantastic job, but there's no doubt there needs to be some um, longer-term vision in terms of captaincy and leadership. Obviously, Pat Cummins at the moment is... Um, He's in there as, as vice captain, and, and I think he could easily go into that role. I've seen him operate New South Wales last year in, in one-day cricket. He captained the, the team in one-day cricket, and the way, because of COVID last year, they pretty much played a whole domestic season. So he, he led the team into the final of the, the one-day competition, and then he was away for the final because of international duty. But you know, New South Wales won that competition, and I think his leadership was fantastic. Uh, I sat in the dressing room a couple of times when he was chatting to the guys, and um, he's got a really good demeanour about him. He's got, um, you know, really strong values and and quite relaxed off the field. So I think he he he's been a calming influence to, the, to a dressing room as well. So I think they've got someone there who could who could easily take over. Um, you know, there's there's probably no one else at the moment in my mind who sort of stands out um, to to take over straight away from Tim Payne. So it might be someone like a, a Pat Cummins, and and then they really um, there's no doubt they need to work on leadership. Um, potential I think over the next three to five years of someone coming through in the ranks. Is that part of your Is brief with what you do? Or, oh, yeah well, I mean my brief with New South Wales cricket obviously so um, we've got a really strong emphasis on uh, building our young leaders so um, for example we've got some guys like Jason Sanger, Jack Edwards, um, Curtis Patterson who you would have just seen just has been recently um, made the Sheffield Shield captain in New South Wales so, so we're trying to identify five or six guys. We're putting them through a, a leadership course, um, which is sort of a more a, a formal way of learning, but we're also going to provide them with a lot of informal ways, you know, speaking to some really good leaders uh, of the past within cricket, also with leaders from other sports and business as well. So um, we feel in, in New South Wales, you know, that, that's also an area that we need because, you know, once the Moses Enriquez and um, the Peter Nevilles and, and these sort of guys retire, we certainly need to... Our young leaders to, to coming through, so there's no shortfall there. So I'd have no doubt, you know, Cricket Australia are thinking the same thing. Um, they don't have eyes on these guys and, and dealing with them every day because obviously they're the national body, but um, certainly you'd hope that they're, they're speaking to the states and making sure that all the states are developing young leaders to, to if they performances can go with that, then they can obviously hopefully be leaders of Cricket Australia down the track. And, and Maxie, if you wind the clock back 50 years and you would take a, a, an Australian test cricketer aside and say one day we would be, uh, the, the Australian side would not just be, I'm not talking about Barry Jarman stepping up or Brian Tabor stepping up, but the actual designated captain was a wicketkeeper and now we're contemplating the fact that the Australian captain would be a bowler, they'd laugh at us. Uh, do you subscribe <laughs> to the theory that that's, 
batsmen are the better option as a captain because of the other things that are on there they've got to think about in the field I think it comes more down to the personality of the of the, of the player um, I don't think every fast bowler for example would be um, able to to captain and to captain a side successfully um, I think there's some out there that, that could like I'm just sure of a name like a Peter Siddle. Like I think, you know, with his experience, um, he's someone who could do it. I know he's done it a little bit with the other eight strikers. Pat Cummins would be in that boat as well. You know, he's really level-headed. He's um, you know a smart guy and, and and certainly understands his game you know really well too. So I think whoever captains one, the one thing you need to do is be confident in your game and your spot in the team as well. That's that's obviously important because then that allows you to. Um, Feed off on the other guys and, and help develop some of the other guys as well. And and, and part of the you know part of, it's like in any business as well. Part of the role of the captain, like it is, I suppose, CEO or you know an executive general manager somewhere, is to actually make sure that when you leave, there's someone else ready to go underneath you. So uh, I'm sure Tim Payne and, and the and Justin Langer and, and the other leaders in that team would be making sure that they're developing at least a couple of good leaders underneath them. Uh, Maxie, do you, do you think Australian cricket's um, in a really good spot at the moment to, to trampoline forward, or, or is there a little bit of work to do still, you know, across the board, all, all formats of the game, with, with what you've seen coming through with younger, younger talent? Uh, in terms of younger talent, um, I think it's, it's pretty strong still. Like, we're seeing um, some good performances from young players last, last year. What happened last year was, I reckon some of the development of some of the young players around Australia just stalled a little bit and that's purely because the Cricket Australia players played so much domestic cricket so you know around Australia um, there was which was great for the competition but it just meant some of the young players missed out but over the next two years if you look at Australia's future tours program they're not going to be playing hardly any domestic cricket maybe one test leading into a, the, the summer series so what it allows is a lot of these young players to to play more matches and you're only going to learn and develop by playing more competitive high level um, matches so this year for example we'll have a lot of our young New South Wales guys playing a lot of cricket I'd, I'd hope you know somewhere like Cricket Victoria you're going to have um, your Mackenzie Harvey etc to, to be playing a lot more um, domestic cricket as well because the, the CA guys will, will be busy playing for Australia so um, I, I think that's certainly going to help develop guys quicker because you, know, you can do as much as you, you want in the nets and spend as much time in the nets, but playing competitive games is where you learn the most. So um, I, I think, as I said, last year it may have been halted by for some players because of that reason, but um, there's going to be a lot more opportunities going forward over the next few years for the guys to get good games into them and, and learn and develop that way. Well, before we let you go, Maxie, last, this time last week we were speaking to Ashley Mallett, who bowled yep. 9,900 and 90 deliveries in first-class cricket. And we felt a little bit intimidated by that. We're excited to know that you've only bowled six more first-class deliveries than Rob and I combined. <laughs> Can you remember those six deliveries, who they were at, and what sort of bowling you were pushing down the pitch? I remember exactly. It was to the current um, chairman of selectors of Cricket Australia, George Bailey. It was, uh, it was the fourth day of a Shield game at um, Tasmania, and there were huge storm clouds coming in from the... Uh, from the ocean, and basically the game was about to get called off. So the captain at the time, Graham Manu, who also works at Cricket Australia now as well, um, asked me to bowl an over, and then literally after my sixth ball of the over, it just started pouring and the game was called off. So I bowled an over of leg spin. I think I, I dragged a couple down, but George was more worried about not getting out to me. So I <laughs> hit, hit one for four and um, and just patted the rest back. <laughs> And, and yet, Ashley Mallard in his first over in Test cricket got Colin Cowdery out. I just, it's just bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Max, bowling, uh, I wasn't blessed with any bowling talent, unfortunately. No, well, neither were we, but we couldn't bat either, so you're ahead of us there. Maxie, it's been an absolute thrill to have you on the program here on the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show. Thanks to Lockie for setting this up, and uh, we look forward to keeping in touch going forward. Thanks for having me, guys. Cheers. Good on you, Maxie. All the best. There he is. Michael Maxi Klinger, a great fella and a great cricketer, obviously, now leading some elite sport up in the New South Wales Cricket Association. Yeah, mighty fine uh, man. A very underrated player. We saw Brad Hodge play a little bit of test cricket. Jamie Siddons was another very talented player that didn't, but that bloke's ability to bounce from all formats of the game quickly with great skill uh, it was quite amazing. He, he was as good to watch in that format because, as I said in the interview, he continued to play 
cricket shots in amongst the other slap bang stuff that went on. Uh, now, a mighty fine player, grossly underrated, I think, across his career in May. He do good stuff in the coaching format. I believe he will coach Australia one day. That is my prediction. You heard it first here on the Two Blacks Chatting Radio Show. 